Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the kickoff season two of our preservation webinar series. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, COVID-19 and library and archival collection. I am Shamin Paul, printing operator five at the Preservation and Conservation Laboratory, Heritage Library Division, NALIS. We ask you to keep your cameras off and your mics muted. You are invited to type your questions into the chat for the question and answer segment at the end of this webinar. Let me introduce our organization. The National Library and Information System Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, NALIS, is the country's coordinator of all library and information services. Beyond the Heritage Library, there are over 25 public libraries, three libraries in correctional institutions, libraries in secondary and primary schools, and special libraries in several governmental agencies, all administered by NALIS. Please visit our website, www.nalis.gov.tt for more information about our services. We'll post the link in the chat of this webinar. One of NALIS's new key responsibilities is to promote and preserve national heritage information. Though the National Library has a comprehensive collection of paper-based items, and electronic audiovisual media, there is a particular emphasis on materials with national and Caribbean origin, focus and authorship. The Heritage Library Division on the second floor of the National Library Building, Port of Spain, Trinidad, helps NALIS fulfill the goal of acquiring, promoting and preserving national heritage information. I invite you to follow the Heritage Library Division on Facebook at NALIS HLD TT. See the link in the chat. Special collections acquired or donated to the Heritage Library Division consist of mainly traditional library items created by or interest to a significant person or organization of Trinidad and Tobago. One would not be surprised to find within these collections, books, newspapers, pamphlets, letters, photographs, film and audio recordings and memorabilia, like the typewriter you see here. The Preservation and Conservation Laboratory is responsible for ensuring the overall longevity of library materials. With attention to the Heritage Library Division and its collections of historical importance. The PAC Laboratory or PAC Lab, which was officially commissioned in 2013, helps NALIS fulfill its role as the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, Preservation and Conservation, or IFLAPAC, Regional Center for the English-Speaking Caribbean. Additionally, this, this arm of the Heritage Library Division advises public and private organizations on the care of their collections and artifacts. The PAC Laboratory has been serving the preservation and conservation needs of clients through fumigation, freeze drying, conservation treatments, collection repair, bindery services, disaster recovery, technical assistance, and preservation training. We look forward to when we carry out our preservation clinics, tours, 
and training sessions in person. However, we are happy that technology allowed us to continue this mission through our preservation webinar series. In case you missed any of our first season, the link to the Nalis YouTube playlist is posted in the chat. Let me take this time now to introduce our facilitator, Ms. Danielle Fraser. Danielle has been the library conservator and head of the Park Lab since 2009. Danielle holds a Master of Science in Information Studies and a Certificate of Advanced Studies in Conservation of Library and Archival Materials from the University of Texas at Austin. She was a 2008 Conservation Fellow of the Library of Congress, Washington, DC. She has been a member of the American Institute for Conservation at the Library Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Danielle enjoyed presenting papers at the annual meetings of regional associations, including Acryl and Caral. So I know she looks forward to presenting today. Over to you, Danielle. Thank you so very much, Charmaine. And welcome, everyone. I am Glad that you have joined us today for our webinar, COVID-19 and Library and Archival Collections. You know, during the pandemic, a key concern for us at Libraries and Archives has been the risk of infection through contact with our collection materials. My goal today is to point you to reliable resources so that you can make guided decisions for your library or archive. According to the World Health Organization, COVID-19 is primarily a respiratory disease caused by the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The virus can spread from an infected person's mouth or nose in small liquid particles when the person coughs, sneezes, sings, breathes heavily, or talks. These liquid particles are different sizes, ranging from larger respiratory droplets to smaller aerosols. This mode of transmission has informed the health protocols issued by the World Health Organization, by the Pan American Health Organization or PAHO, the Ministry of Health for those of us in Trinidad and Tobago, or your local health authority. As part of a comprehensive strategy to suppress the spread of the virus and to save lives, most, if not all, health authorities worldwide are urging populations to practice the three W's. I'm sure you know it. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, or sanitize your hands if soap and water is not readily available. However, I want to make a special note here about collection safety. Hand washing is preferred as hand sanitizer does not remove dirt or oils and and may leave a residue that could, dam that could be very damaging to our collections over time. So we've included the article by the Library of Congress Preservation Directorate regarding the examination of the impact of some common hand sanitizers on different library materials. The link is in the chat. Wear a mask at all times, it's the second W, and we are it's recommended that you do this in gatherings and in public spaces. And the third W, watch your distance. When with others, especially those who are not a part of your household. Now, let's go to our first poll question. I would like to know how many of you have actually heard about the Realm project. So we're launching our first question. You've never heard about it. Perhaps you know just a little bit about it. You've heard about it, but you've never used the information. Or maybe you've heard about it and you are actually implementing aspects of the project as it relates to the operations of your library or archive. Uh, feel free to make a choice in the poll that you see on screen.
Excellent. Let's share those results. 78% uh, of you have never heard about it. There are a few who have know just a little about it, and there's some who have heard about it, but they've never used the information. So I think you are in the ideal spot because that's going to be one of the things I'm going to share about right now. The Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums, or REALM, Realm, is a research project which started in 2020. The aim of the project has been to provide data to libraries, archives, and museums to better understand the virus and to aid in decision-making regarding their operations. Realm recognizes that every institution is different. So they advise that you use the data along with your local governing guidance to inform your practices and policies. Realm has developed a number of resources and toolkits to help support libraries, archives, and museums in making decisions on how COVID-19 can be addressed in these workplaces. And permit me just to switch to one of the wonderful resources that Realm has provided. So the upcoming images are from the REM project. And I'm so grateful that the REM project materials are shared under a Creative Commons license that allows for non-commercial sharing and adapting of the materials that they've produced. So let's take a look at REM 101. The project is a partnership between OCLC, which is the lead and manager of the project, the Institute of Museum and Library Archives, uh, IMLS, that's primarily the project funder, and IMLS is also respond responsible for convening the steering committee and the working groups that are involved in the project, and Battelle, that's a company that's actually conducting the literature reviews, and the research on how long the COVID-19 virus survives on materials that are used in libraries, archives, and museums. Now, this science-based information is not issued as recommendations or guidelines, but to simply help inform your decisions um, in the process of doing your reopening at your institution. Now, they recognize that our knowledge about the COVID-19 um, pandemic continues to evolve. We know that the virus spreads by direct transmission when virus-containing droplets are expelled from an infected person and they enter the system of an uninfected person. Also, indirect transmission occurs when objects harboring the virus uh, for an extended period when objects, sorry, harbor the, the virus for an extended period after being contaminated by an infected person. However, the survival time of the virus on a physical surface depends on various factors, including the composition and the texture of the surface, as well as even the environmental factors of temperature, relative humidity, the air quality, the airflow, all of these things make an impact on the survivability of the virus. Given the emerging knowledge about the SARS-CoV-2, the Realm Project says to keep these known unknowns in mind when looking at the data that they've produced. First, it is not known how much virus an infected person will leave on an object through coughing, sneezing or touching with contaminated hands. There's so many factors that can impact the viral load of an infected person and that could vary uh, through individuals. Two, it is not known how much virus cells someone can actually pick up from an object used by an infected person. So should someone have used a book or library material, it's not known exactly how 
much of that virus particles are going to be transferred from one person to the other through the use of the objects. And the third known unknown is that it's not known how much of the virus is needed to cause an infection. This infection threshold can vary greatly from individual to individual. So I emphasize this particular bit of the Realm 101 as we understand this project to know that as new information emerges, we may have to adapt our processes and policies. Now, the aim of the laboratory testing was to determine how long does the virus remain active on materials commonly found in laboratories, archives, and museums. And by active, they mean that the virus cells themselves are viable and that they are able to cause infection. So not just viral particles, but that the virus cells are able to actually cause an infection. So these tests were conducted by Battelle in their laboratory. Uh, they did it by applying the virus on materials held at standard room temperature and relative humidity conditions. For each of the 10 rounds of tests, the sample materials that were donated by the Library of Congress and the US National Archives were cut into rectangular coupons. And then drops of the virus were applied using fake saliva or artificial saliva, fake spit, the quantity of viable virus is then measured at selected time points to capture the attenuation rate or the drop in the total virus. Attenuation refers to the weakening or the deactivation of the virus particles. So they are no longer infectious. So materials were tested in either unstacked or stacked configurations to help stimulate the stacking that might happen when they are placed in a book drop or perhaps back onto a bookshelf. Now the full testing results and the testing protocols, et cetera, are available on the Realm website uh, if you're interested in looking at those details. However, I want us to take a look at some of the great, um, some of the great opportunities, the, some of the great visuals that are provided by Realm itself. So here's the first one. This refers to how long the virus survives on all the materials that were tested. So here's a, a, a chart that shows all of the materials. So for instance, at the top here, we have DVD case, and that's the material that was tested here. And in the unstuck, where you just have one single item versus stuck, where they show about three of them stuck together, in the unstuck configuration, the virus remained viable only for one day. However, in the stacked configuration where materials, like materials were stacked and touching each other, the virus remained viable for six days. But I want us to actually take a closer look at some of the categories of materials as they relate to the materials that we would see in our library and archival collections. So here we see books and paper provided in this visual aid. And just before we jump to that, I actually want to do another poll. I would like to find out what type of materials do you have in your collection? What are the things that you are concerned about as it relates to the COVID-19 and circulating among your clients, with your staff members, et cetera? So we just launched a poll. Feel free to place your answer on the poll, what type of materials? And you could select more than one. You may have soft cover books, probably you have hard cover books. Do you have leather books as well? Uh, do you have a collection of magazines? Or are you primarily files and folders? Uh, do you possibly have CDs and DVDs? And 
as a final option, perhaps you are actually loaning out laptops or tablets to members of your staff, et cetera. So staff or members of your public, your clients. All right. And uh, sorry, that choice seven was uh, an error, <laughs> uh, just a gap in the options there. But soft book covers, hard book covers, are your books covered in leather? Do you have magazines, file folders, CDs and DVDs, or perhaps you're loaning out laptop, laptops or uh, tablets? Thank you so very much for participating in that. Let's see what the results are. So a majority of you indicated that you do have books primarily as well as files and folders. A few indicated laptops and tablets. So the information that we're sharing will definitely, I think, cover because uh, Battelle thankfully researched quite a range of materials that are commonly found in libraries, archives, and museums. So let's take a look. So here we have how long the virus would survive on books and paper. So we see here for softback book covers, uh, unstacked configuration, the virus survives just one day. And it seems to be similar for both soft and hardback covers. However, if they are stacked six days, the virus could remain viable. Um, looking at archival folders, the virus remains viable only up to two days. Uh, just plain paper pages up to three days. The plastic protective cover, if it's unstacked, three days, the virus remain viable for, if they are stacked configuration up to six, uh, braille, children, board books, magazine pages. We saw a number of you mentioning that. Uh, if they are stacked, typically they are, uh, four days. Leather books or synthetic leather even, uh, the, viable, the virus can remain viable on those items up to eight days. Now let's take a look at plastics. And the plastics could range. We may have DVD cases. We may have the polyester film that we put around to protect our books. Um, perhaps even storage bags, storage containers, et cetera. And so they looked at quite a range of things. So as it relates to the DVD cases, if they are unstacked within one day, you have the virus uh, no longer surviving all the way up to six uh, for those Plastic book covers, uh, three days in the unstacked configuration, however, six days in the storage bins, storage containers, up to five days for those items. You may have some plexiglass uh, involved in uh, items of your collection, perhaps uh, five days for those as well. Uh, if you're looking at even upholstery, they've included that as well here. Uh, on vinyl upholstery, you can have the virus remaining viable up to eight days. Now, looking at media, I saw, I know that an, a few of you indicated that you do have DVDs, CDs, etc. So, thinking of the DVDs and the CDs, uh, the virus remains viable, survives for one day on a DVD case, if it's not stuck. However, if it is stuck, you can have the virus remaining on it for six days. Uh, the disc itself, that polycarbonate in the uh, DVD or CD, the virus survives on that in the unstuck for five days. 
and they mentioned USB cassettes here as well, five leaves. Now, that idea of stacked and unstacked, and we could sort of understand how it would make sense that the virus survives longer when the items are stacked. Remember, airflow, air quality, exposure to temperature and relative humidity all impact how quickly the virus can actually be denatured or actually dies on a surface. So if you have the item stacked, it's gonna be a little more difficult for the virus to actually be exposed to those things that would help it become um, denatured. So looking at the DVD cases, for instance, it's one versus six days, looking at unstacked and stacked. Soft cover books, again, the same one to six. Hard cover, we have that similar one to six as well. And if you're looking at the plastic protective covers, those covers that are around our books, the unstacked configuration, three days, the virus can survive for six days, as, much, as many as six days uh, for the stacked configuration. Now, I am grateful that the Realm project took a further look at surfaces, recognizing that, of course, um, exhibitions, furnishings, um, items that we may be loaning out that are not just solely uh, our collection items. Uh, so looking at those things, just a couple of them here. Uh, for instance, if you have marble or brass, uh, the virus can survive two days on those surfaces. However, six days, within six days, the virus um, can survive on laminate, glass, and powdered coated steel. So of course, for surfaces though, though this is mentioned, it's also a good uh, idea that, uh, that we would more than likely be uh, cleaning Right, so that's actually one of the things that I would like to have us discuss. So, to quarantine or not to quarantine? The quarantine or the clean? That is the question. Um, so I want to know, I'm gonna launch another poll. What have you been doing in your organization? Have you implemented a wait period or quarantine period as it relates to your collections? We've just launched a poll. Feel free to go ahead and make your choice. Maybe you haven't. Perhaps you're looking at something that is just one day perhaps two days, or are you saying three days or more for that wait period before items are reused by someone else? Um, what has been implemented at your institution for dealing with your collections? All right. I'm going to share the results. A 62%, more than half of those responded, indicate that yes, they've implemented a wait period of three days or more. Uh, a little more than a third have indicated that they have no wait period or quarantine implemented for their collection. So let's get into that a little bit. Let's discuss that a little bit more. Now, NEDCC, or the Northeast Document Conservation Center, has created a guide on disinfecting books and other collections. And they provide some great detailed considerations that you ought to take a look at when determining whether it's appropriate to quarantine or to clean an item. We have included this as part of our, of our webinar resources. I encourage you to download uh, the items from the link that was provided. Now, the thing about quarantining versus cleaning, 
In general, NEDCC recommends quarantining over cleaning or disinfection. And this is because cleaning and disinfection methods can cause damage to collection items. In fact, disinfection is not recommended at all for rare or valuable collection items, unless under the guidance of a conservator. So those items that are very rare, those items that are part of your special collections, et cetera, and are valuable to your institution, ought not to be cleaned at all, unless you have the guidance of a professional. But let's consider some of the alternatives and their effects. So we may be thinking, well, why not use a disinfectant or cleaner, something that's of a liquid, maybe to wipe on or something to spray. Now, liquid disinfectants and cleaners can discolor and stain items. NEDCC indicates that their chemicals can damage and degrade collection materials over time. So we may not see some of the effects immediately uh, as we're using chemicals, et cetera, but note that you can actually have that degradation and that damage happening over time. Now, as it relates to fogging or using sprayers or vaporizers, not only are the chemicals used in this, these machines potentially damaging to collections, the impact is rather limited. Because if you think about it, the fog happens in an open space, but it's not gonna have an impact on contaminated surfaces that are between the stacks, or if you have items that are inside of boxes, or even between the pages. It would mean that you have to get that fog into every single page of a book. You could just imagine how difficult that might be to do. And similarly with UV light, UV radiation, it is not as effective in sanitizing surfaces which are not exposed to the light. And you actually have to have a strong amount of UV light for a lengthy period of time in order to have that sterilization take place. So, UV light, unfortunately, can also cause irreversible fading, discoloration, and embrittlement of collection items. And I encourage you to take a look at some of our um, season two, where we would have dealt completely with light and its effects on our collections. Now, also, the thing about UV light is that you would need special protective gear in order to reduce the risk of working with the UV light. So anyone who's working and handling the UV light radiation wands or equipment, et cetera, would need that special training as well as that special protective gear to ensure that their skin and their eyes are protected. Now we may think that yes, the virus uh, when, when applied to high heat can actually uh, high temperatures can actually be denatured that way. However, to effectively kill the virus, high temperatures must be sustained for 20 minutes or more. So imagine that you have to actually bake your items for as long as 20 minutes. Now, this could be very damaging to collection items. Uh, NEDCC has seen that the glues and some of the pages, etc., cetera, were cockled and warped um, glues will no longer function in on the backs of books, et cetera. So that heat treatment is one that could be rather damaging to your items. Now, the thing about quarantining is that it does not require any special equipment or training, and it does not pose any risk to your collections. And you don't have to handle the item page by page to ensure that it is disinfected. So in a sense, time, is the best disinfectant that we can use. Now you can use the realm findings that we reviewed just a moment ago to determine the length of the quarantine. And of course, noting that they would have looked at certain environmental conditions in conducting that test. And they did so in a very controlled manner. Um, there was very limited airflow, air circulation was limited in those testing scenarios that they were doing to get those results. So all of those things can factor into making that decision. Now, one thing that's mentioned about um, quarantining is that if you don't have a designated space, perhaps your location is not large enough for you to actually have a clear 
area that is not going to be accessed by any of your staff or members of the public in order to quarantine, any DCC suggests that you can use bins or bags to ensure that the items are not accidentally handled by anyone else. However, please note that tightly sealed containers can cause issues by creating potentially damaging microclimates. So we'd want to be careful with that. Now, when we think about, well, what, what should we be doing? Are we doing enough? Are we maybe doing equivalent to what other institutions are doing? It's always good to sort of look at what are some of the common practices globally. Thankfully, in their webpage, COVID-19 and the global library field, IFLA, or the International Federation of Library Associations and Organizations, has compiled key resources and information for libraries in responding to the pandemic, including is information about library activities in countries around the world. In the section on handling materials, we see the various measures taken by libraries around the world. And the link to this webpage has been included in our webinar resource. Now, in October, and I want to um, make sure that we understand that this, of course, would have been in October. In October, these were the figures that were seen for, sorry, yes. these were the figures that were seen for some countries mentioned on the IFLA website. So note, however, that these recommendations may have changed since that time based on what the um, spread would have been of the virus within their population, what may have been some of their procedures um, with respect to lockdowns or, or shutdowns, et cetera. So what has been done in England in October, 2020, was that they had a wait period of 72 hours. Denmark, on the other hand, because their uh, COVID-19 um, spread was looking extremely good in the sense of it wasn't uh, spread very widely within the population, uh, their library said no quarantine was necessary. Uh, so Slovakia uh, went as far as five days and Australia uh, did 24 hours. So institutions were looking at their own local uh, scenarios in order to make those final decisions. Now, I want to thank you for attending. Uh, we've just come to the end of it. Of course, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I look forward to having any sort of further discussion on this topic. Now, I remind you to download the webinar resources for COVID-19 and library archival collections. In it, I included not only the links to some of the websites and documents that were mentioned, but I also included the PDFs that were the visual aids to help you very quickly get a sense of the results that were done via the Realm project. Uh, just before I take the questions, I want to invite you to join us for our upcoming webinars. On February 23rd, we explore time capsules. We share how the conservation of items from a 1934 time capsule helped inform our recommendations for installing new time capsules. So if you're your organization, sorry, for your organization or perhaps for your uh, family, uh, it might be something uh, of interest for you to hear the recommendations we have there. And Join us in March as we welcome Claire Maguire. She is the IFLA Policy and Resource Officer, and she will share on the role and the purpose of the IFLA Risk Register for Documentary Heritage. Now, if you're holding a collection that you feel might be facing a risk from natural disasters, from conflict, or simply you may not know enough about risk reduction planning, you'd want to learn about how this resource can help you find some solutions. So I hope you do join us then. And in April, 
we welcome Dr. Melissa Tadoun, the lead library conservator of the Poison Book Project, to share her team's research as they investigate toxic components of book clots. These are books that would have been in the Victorian era that were mass produced. And so it's interesting to hear their findings as well as their recommendations for should you encounter a poison book. So I hope that you would join us in our coming webinars. Be sure to register using the links in the chat. And let's go to our questions. Just reading from the top, I see that Cleborn Raffet said, I'm getting the impression that physical browsing is no longer an option for our patrons. Now, that's an interesting one. And I think definitely looking at what uh, is said in the IFLA document that I mentioned uh, would be of interest to you because it varied. If you have patrons uh, sanitizing their hands, being checked by temperature, um, also having masks, wearing masks while they are using the materials on your compound in your organization itself directly, you have a bit more control over those items than say when someone borrows it and leaves to go with it, they may be reading it in their at their home, taking it with them around the house, taking them, taking the items with them um, throughout their days, weeks that they may have it on loan. They're not necessarily being masked up. You're not sure how they're sanitizing their hands, et cetera. So those items that are coming back into your institution, I think they are of a higher risk than those that may possibly be um, a part of the browsing that goes on in your institution. So it is still something to consider, but perhaps noting that you do have better control as it relates to the browsing that goes on in your institution. From Elizabeth Matthews, I see that you see here, I'm overseeing the use of an on-site vault in my office. Every unit utilizes the files in the vault on a daily basis. Therefore, quarantine for three days will not be possible. Is there any other solution? Now we're looking at files. Let me just uh, pop back to the list. Archival folders. Um, the virus survived on those for two days. So perhaps two days might be possible. But again, if it, if the items are being used in a very controlled manner, perhaps you're ensuring that persons are washing their hands or maybe that they're using gloves while they access those materials, that they are properly masked up, that they are using them for a shorter period of time. I think the exposure that could happen on the items would probably be limited. But the aspect of cleaning now, again, if these are not items that are of great value and you are willing to run the risk of the damage that can happen with some of the disinfection or chemical cleaning, well then perhaps that may be an option for you. But again, remember that you do run that risk. So again, it's up to the institutions to decide which, which level of risk do we want to uh, take on as it relates to uh, either quarantining or sanitizing the items. And I believe, I believe that is it for questions.
Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us for our webinar. I hope that this information is going to be useful to you. Again, I encourage everyone to be sure to download the webinar resources. I have put into that folder that you download all of the visual aids uh, as it relates to summarizing the results from the Realm project, as well as our listing of links in order for you to get more of a idea of some of the things as it relates to COVID-19 and your library and archival collections. So thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your feedback. We look forward to seeing you uh, in our upcoming webinars in all the way till April. Thank you. Have a good day.